Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about therapy. I'm a, I come from a therapy background rather than a contemplative background. And I'm kind of very interested in where these two meet up. So I'm going to try and have a look at that. Before I do, I want to give, tell you a little story that I like to tell about compassion that some of you will have heard. And it's a story about how compassion can change you. So the story goes like this. There is a, a lady who's slightly overweight. And one day she's rushing around and she slips on the stairs and falls and bangs her head and has a vision of going to heaven. In heaven, she meets God. And she says, that's it, then I'm done for. And God says, no, 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 you've got 40 years, but you have to look after yourself. You have to nurture yourself, be compassionate to yourself, and then you've got a long time. So she came around from the vision, and she thought, wow, this is great. Okay, 40 years. So she did exactly that. She went and uh, lost weight. She went on a diet. She took exercise. She did Kirsten's self-compassion course, and she was fantastic. <laughs> she looked great. And uh, last little bit, she had some plastic surgery. Came out of the hospital, walked across the road, and unfortunately was knocked over by a truck. <laughs> so she ends in, up in heaven, and she says to God, what happened? You told me I had 40 years. And he said, I'm so sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the thing is, uh, compassion can change us in ways that even others won't recognize. So, okay, let's take the first, first slide. Okay. So there are two, okay, so we're gonna go through this quite quickly. There are two psychologies of compassion. Most uh, approaches to compassion recognize that it's something to do with the paying attention, the sensitivity to suffering the self and others with a commitment to do something about it. Okay, and again, and again. Yeah, so the first psychology is, as Christian said in her uh, superb talk, uh, this paying attention, turning towards. And when we turn towards, what is it that we're able to kind of contain and hold? And the second one is to alleviate. Okay, what is it that we need to alleviate? Now, from a therapist's point of view, those actually are quite complex states for people who are depressed or have eating disorders. Okay, so it just, I just put the whole, whole slide up, I think it's probably the best thing. So the thing is, there are two types of issue that we have to be concerned about in therapy. Firstly, the ability to be compassionate, to give compassion to self and others. And this requires the ability to uh, pay attention and also have empathic awareness. But there are things that will facilitate compassion giving, and there are things that will inhibit it. For example, it's easier to be compassionate to people you love than people you hate. It's easier to be compassionate to people who are like you than people who seem very dissimilar to you. But for therapy, it's also important that patients are able to be, receive compassion and to be changed by the process of accepting compassion, taking compassion in. And here again, there are facilitators and inhibitors, things that make it possible for people to take in compassion, things that make it difficult for people to take in compassion. And one of the things that makes it difficult for people to take in compassion is what we call emotional memory. Now, emotional memory means that when people have experienced compassion in the past, it's always been tinged with something else. So, I'll give you an example. Supposing that you like holidays. From a child, you've always liked going on holidays, it's great. When you think about holidays, it makes you excited. But then, on one holiday, you get severely beaten up and robbed, and you end up in hospital. Okay? What will happen the following year when you think about holidays? Well, what happens is that trauma memory will come back, and so holidays are no longer pleasant to you. And this is what happens with many of our people that we work with. The attachment system, the system that Emiliana was talking about, becomes toxic. So there's a fusion with the fear system. This is typical of a child, for example, who's loved in the morning, but then the parent gets drunk and beats them up at night. So there are these different kind of emotional memories that get fused together, such that when they begin to feel compassion, they are opening up the attachment system, opening up their wish for connectedness. But unfortunately, in the emotional memory, connectedness is also toxic. So the point is then we need to be thinking about compassion, and compassion therapy is a flow. It's the compassion that you are open and able to feel for others. It's the compassion that others are able to give to you, and you're able to experience this. And there are various uh, trainings that we do, people, on compassion awareness training. And there's also, as Christian was saying, these important um, self-compassion practices, OK? Next slide. OK, so why do we need compassion then? And again, 
We need compassion because life is hard. And again, that's great. <laughs> so, uh, so it happens to all of us. And this is important because in compassion focused therapy, we think about why is life, okay, let's go on again. We think about why is life hard. Now, for those of you who come from the contemplative traditions, you'll have a whole uh, understanding of the noble truths and so forth. But compassion for us is about a reality check. And the reality check has three core themes to it. The first one is the, under let's go. The first one is the understanding that we are all biologically created. Your brain was created by your genes. It was not created by you, it was created for you. Your brain that is capable of anger, anxiety, passion, joy, lust, that's all being created for you. You didn't create that. And there are genetic variations into how easy those emotions will be for you. Your capacity for cruelty, and if you look at history, humans have been horrendously cruel, that's built into your brain. That was built by nature, not by you. Secondly, you're all vulnerable to the fact that we are susceptible to diseases and injuries. Every one of us here has a lifespan which will have a, has a start and an end. No one escapes this. So whereas in the traditions, the Buddhist traditions, we might say, um, <clears throat> just like me, you want to be happy, just like me, you want to be free of suffering. In the compassion traditions, we say, just like you, I am vulnerable. To disease. Just like you, I could have a blood test tomorrow that says my life is going to end. Just like you, I could hear that my son has been killed in a car crash. Because these things can happen to any of us at any time. And this is the beginning of recognition. As Christian says, we're all in this together. No one, no one escapes. And the more we work together, the more we can make this journey of suffering uh, bearable. For example, I can see you. Because 50 years ago, somebody invented a treatment for cataracts. I had a very nasty form of fast developing cataracts. I would be blind now, but I'm not, because somebody addressed that problem of suffering. And the third point is that we are all socially created. And this means that if I had been adopted as a two or three day old baby into a violent drug gang, being snatched out of hospital, this version of Paul Gilbert would not exist. And we ask our patients, so what version would exist? Well, the version that would exist would probably be violent, would have probably done horrible things, might be dead, might have been tortured, might have been a torturer, might be in prison. You're only a version of yourself. You have no idea what other versions are in you, um, what other environments would have made of you. We also know that the early life affects genetic expression, and it certainly affects brain development. So we are created by our social circumstances. And as John was saying earlier, this is fundamental. We have to address the fact that right now, children are living in conditions that are damaging their brains. Right? We know this. And the compassion action is to address this fundamentally. OK, so let's have a think about the challenge of the compassionate mind. We could do this quite quickly. So what has this brain given us? Uh, well, it's given us a lot of trouble, actually. It certainly, it certainly can create a... Okay, let's go. Okay, so, and let's go. It can certainly um, do wonderful things. That's why we're here now. But basically, as was pointed out by Emiliana, we have an old brain which has a whole lot of emotions and emotional systems in it, which go right back. And that's why we can study rats, because we are part of the flow of life, right? The second is that we have a new brain that evolved about two million years ago. Now, this new brain is fabulous. It does these fantastic scientific things, but it also will trap you in states of mind that can be very painful. So just two more. Okay, so we get loops in the mind. So, for example, imagine the zebra running away from a lion. The zebra gets away. And within a very short period of time, we'll settle down and go back to the herd and go eating again. But that won't happen for a human because of the new brain. Because a human will start thinking, oh my God, can you imagine what would have happened if I'd gotten caught? I know. <laughs> Being strangled by a lion. <laughs> they wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh my God, what about tomorrow? And the children, oh my God. <laughs> so what we know is that a lot of people with mental health problems get into loops that they can't get out of. They ruminate about things that frighten them. They ruminate about being no good. They focus on all the negative aspects. Okay, so part of the 
issue of therapy is to help break them from loops. And remember, if they have emotional memories which are to do with trauma, those loops are going to be very powerful. This mindfulness mind is the, the capacity to be aware of awareness, awareness of being, right? Now, John will train you in mindfulness much better than I could, but this is an evolutionary, phenomenally important quality. It's almost like a quality of actually developing a visual system. Before a visual system, before animals had the capacity to be aware of light, there was no awareness of light. But of course, light exists. This is, we now have a brain to be aware of being aware that no other animal has. And this actually puts on our shoulders fantastic responsibilities, in fact, because we can literally wake up. Chimpanzee can't wake up. There's no way a chimpanzee can wake up to the reality of the life they're in and start to make choices. A chimpanzee can't look at their body and think, oh my God, have I got to lose weight? Okay, so the, the, the mindfulness, I think, is, is there's an incredible, complex and important story to tell about how evolution has given rise to this kind of mind and the implications of having this kind of mind. Compassion, though, we see very much as Amelia Ali was talking about, it's rooted deeper in uh, brain systems to do with intentionality and motivation. And, and if you orientate yourself to compassion, then you're going to change the whole orientation of your mind. So compassion will affect what you think about your behavior, your emotions. Whereas if you are, okay, yeah, next one, thank you, next one. If you are orientated to competitiveness, then your whole mind and whole sense of self becomes orientated to that, and that will take on shapes and patterns. And as Emiliana says, we've got to be thinking about these things as shapes and patterns. So the sense of self you choose to be and train to be is very important for the kind of mind you're going to grow and develop over a period of time. Okay, get some. So let's have a think now quickly about the emotions. Emotions are very important because we know there are different types of emotions. This is called function analysis, evolutionary function analysis, where we understand the functions of emotions in terms of three core functions. There are more, but we use three. The first one is linked to the threat system. <coughs> now, your threat system is your basic system. It's the one that has priority, OK? It's not your fault that it has priority, but it does. Anger and anxiety are the quickest and easiest emotions to stimulate in you. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, anger, for example. If you go Christmas shopping and you go into ten shops, and in nine shops the, serv the assistants are very uh, helpful to you, but in one shop they're very rude and they make you wait and they try and sell you something you don't really want and you come out and you're really annoyed about this, who do you think about when you go home? Yeah, I see you all know, don't you? See, 90% of the people were kind to you. But you'll be thinking, God, where do they get these people from? Shall I write to the store manager and get them fired? They're so rude. OK, now that, that is going to be doing things to your body because you're in a loop now. You remember those loops I talked about? So you're in the anger system. You'll be stimulating the threat system and so on and so on. What about if you? If you, if you, on purpose, decide that you are going to recall, you're going to recall the other nine people. Just spend time remembering how kind that person was in that shop, remembering the smile, remember how he or she went to try and find you the thing you wanted, right? So in compassion focus therapy, this training of remember, 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 notice, 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 kindness and build on it, notice feelings of positive feeling and building is very important. So that's the problem of life. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> OK, so you also have two types of positive system, which again, Emiliana was addressing. One is your, uh, one is your um, system for rewards. Next slide. So if you win the lottery, for example, you're worth 100 million euro, uh, not euros, not euros, is it? Dollars. Um, <laughs> you will have a sympathetic arousal rush, right? It's a dopamine rush. And both your threat system and your, this positive system of sympathetic arousal, you won't be able to sleep. You'll have a hypermania. You'll be constantly thinking about your money. You'll try and do John's mindfulness. You'll be sitting there mindfully. Oh my god, a hundred million dollars. Oh, no, no, no. Just present moment, present moment. Oh my god. OK. So dopamine is, well, give you a rush. Okay, and also we know that these emotions, 
are very important in the creation of affiliative experience, particularly early in life, the joyfulness and the experience of another. And being with others, of course, is very joyful. But we have another emotional system, which is the one we're particularly interested in, which we call a soothing system. This is an endorphin oxytocin system, and this is associated with soothing and calming down. Again, Emiliana talked in terms of the, yeah, let's go, the parasympathetic nervous system, and this is where the ability to feel safe. Now, we use the word safe, not safety. In our model, safety is the absence of threat. This is not the absence of threat. This is the presence of something that actually creates it's a certain kind of feeling, which is a, uh, usually connectedness, but not always usually connectedness. So um, this ability to be calmed down in the presence of the other, the ability of love to calm you is a fundamental property of the human mind, right? If you are distressed, the chances are you'll turn to somebody who you think loves you, and if they give you a cuddle and they talk to you and they validate you, it makes you feel good. It calms you down. So the experience of safeness occurs in the connectedness that we experience with other people. And interestingly enough, if you go and do a workshops on, let's go on. If, we, if you go and do workshops like John's uh, workshops and so forth, what you find after a period of time is that you calm down, you slow down. But you don't just slow down and become an isolated being. What happens is, as you slow down, you start feeling more connected. It might be more connected to the place where you are the beauty of the trees, the wonder of the sky. So there is something about this system, this calming, soothing system, which is in the context of affiliative relating that is absolutely fundamental. Okay, so there we go. That's how we see it. Okay, on we go. Next one. So you have in your brain this basic system that will calm your threat system if you can, but activate it, okay? Keep an eye on here. Okay, so let's move on. Next one, yeah. So this is uh, showing that we care. Going that extra thing. Okay, so what are the dimensions of the compassion then? So just put them all up, I think. It'd be easy if you just put them all up and I'll just go through them. So it, when we are developing compassionate mind, we're developing certain qualities of the mind. Firstly, as Kristen said again, is motivation, motivation, motivation. Or as John says, intention, intention, intention. So when we have an intention to be kind, to be helpful, to be aware of the problems that our brain give us, and that we will do what we can to be helpful. This is the beginning of, uh, of the body sat for motivation. Then we become sensitive, we become aware, we pay attention to suffering. When we pay attention to suffering, as Amelia Allen was saying, then you have an emotional connection to the suffering, but you have to be able to tolerate that. If you get very distressed by other people's suffering and you want to close it down, it's a problem. You also have to have what we call empathy, the ability to make sense of it, which is slightly different from the how the neurophysiologists see empathy. This is a more traditional psychotherapeutic concept, which is empathy involves imagination. You have to imagine yourself in the mind of the other. <clears throat> and there's non-judgment, okay? Empathy, incidentally, is totally neutral. In fact, Edwin uh, Rush is here, and uh, he's got a fantastic uh, empathy uh, website, so you might meet him at uh, some point in the conference. Um, <clears throat> So the worst torturer to have, of course, is an empathic one. So the non-empathic one puts the gun to your head, the empathic one puts it to your child and tells, says, tell me your secrets, you see. Because they understand. Empathic marketing. <laughs> okay, so this is, the, these are important attributes that we teach patients. Now the point is, when we are moving into patients' threat systems, and this is where we might be slightly different from mindfulness, when we move into patient's threat system, when we're beginning to engage with trauma, the idea is we go step by step, step by step. We don't go diving in and just let it come. We actually slow people down. Do not go into these areas until some green system stuff is built for you, until you have some capacity of compassion, because compassion is what's going to help you in the threat system. If you go into the threat system with no compassionate ability, it's going to be really tough. So that's the story we tell. So we do a lot of building of compassion, compassion itself, com uh, compassion imagery, and so on. Uh, OK, so let's go on. And then we have got one more minute. We have these other qualities. Next one. These are, and just put them all up. These are alleviation qualities, how to pay attention to that which is helpful, how to think in a way which is compassionate and helpful, the kinds of feelings that are generated, and the behavior. Now, compassionate behavior is very often to do with the courage, the development of courage. If you're an agoraphobic, 
Compassionate behavior isn't sitting at home eating chocolates because that's easy. Compassion is going out and confronting your anxiety. Okay, go on. Let's just move on here. So the compassionate mode of mentality now is this way in which it organizes our intentionality, organizes our minds, and organizes our brains in certain kinds of ways. And we must also remember issues like this. Now, this is Bob Geldof, who became very angry at the Ethiopian famine in 1982-83. In very angry. And as a result of that anger, he generated Live Aid. That's the next and Live Aid, in the end, rose over 100 million pounds. Okay? So the interesting point that all of us have to face is that compassion in the world, compassion action can come from mindfulness, can come from training, but there is something else that we need to be thinking about is how do we stimulate more Bob Geldofs? How do we stimulate more people who are going to take compassion action? Because compassion action is what actually is going to help us. So the last slide then, just put it all up. So we have to be aware that we are potentially a wonderful species, but we have a brain through no fault of our own that can drive us crazy, quite literally, and do the most destructive things. What's happening in the world right now is a waking up. We're waking up to the brain that we've got, the responsibility that we have to turn to become a more compassionate species. So finally, then, I would say that by improving our understanding of the nature of compassion, particularly facilitators and inhibitors, okay, both forgiver and receiver, we may be better placed to create a more compassionate and better world for the generations to follow. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.